Thank you, Tom. Uh, I want to thank you and all of my friends at the Sausalito Yacht Club. Good evening. Uh, this is a, a singular honor uh, because we are in trying times, uh, the kind that the Chinese in their traditional curse call interesting times, as in, may you live in interesting times, you fill in the blank. Uh, but all, all of the people that I've been listening to on the airwaves and on the internet have been looking for uh, a silver lining in this situation. And I think that the silver lining might be that we have learned two new dirty words in this crisis, cruise and ship. So this evening, I'm going to talk about a ship that was built for that purpose but I'd like to talk about the ship as the ship and the men and women who built her, who carried it out, who brought her into service. I started this uh, project uh, 37 years ago. I got wind of a project to build a, a sailing cruise ship. Forgive the, uh, I hope the children are in bed. Uh, and I convinced a New York publisher I convinced a New York publisher that this was a historic event, the building of the first commercial sailing ship for commercial purposes in, oh, about 60 years. It was a historical event. It needed a book, and I was the one to write it. Uh, my ocean racing credentials and having sailed across the Pacific and across the Atlantic really didn't count much. I think that what counted with the publisher was that I had been on the staff of their hometown newspaper and they'd known my byline for years. In any event, I got the contract. Uh, I got an advance enough to uh, accompany the building of the ship. And I began to follow this, this story. The background to the story, of course, is the, the kind of difficulty that the United States suffered in the absence of petroleum, imported petroleum, in 1973 with the OPEC uh, shutdown of oil imports, exports to the United States, and then again in 1979. As a result of those things, there were those of us who dreamed of being able to bring sail power back to the oceans of the world because, because oil was too expensive. Bunker fuel was much too expensive. There were three kinds or four kinds of people who uh, dreamed of new sailing ships at the time. And naval architects and engineers used to, in those days, in 1979, 1980, 1982 and three, get together in conferences and share papers. And they had schemes ranging, ranging from square riggers with aluminum sails to cargo carrying submarines pulled by huge kites above the surface of the ocean. And then there were the technical purists, including Jacques Gusto, who advanced schemes like the aspirated airfoils of his entry into the sailing ship sweepstakes. There were also businessmen and bean counters uh, including the Japanese shipping company that ran the Shin Aitoku Maru, the little tanker that could, that was fitted with engines and metal sails in 1979. And then there were the romantics, like me, who wanted the age of sail to come back so they could go to sea under sail. This was Cousteau's entry, Alcyone. You can see she was not very large, and those two stack-like looking things are the aspirated airfoils. Uh, you can read technical papers about them. I won't bore you because I never really understood the principle of how she gained lift. In any event, on the first attempt to cross the Atlantic, the Alcyon lost one of the two aspirated airfoils overboard and returned to France. The little tanker that could, Shinai Tokomaru, you see here underway in 1980 with her metal sails, in the inland sea of Japan, where the owners reported she gave them a 30% savings in fuel costs when she was under sail compared to her normal operating costs. And there was a side benefit, 
one of the longtime crew members who always got seasick on the first day of, at sea, if the sails were deployed, no longer got seasick. Cruise ships, forgive the dirty word, 40 years ago were repurposed transatlantic passenger liners like the one pictured here, which was born the France and became, as she is here, the Norway. But there were people looking ahead, disruptors, if you will, people who thought in terms of what might the future hold. And the lead group among those people, the practical dreamers, the guys like our own entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, were the Finns and engineers and scientists at Wartsila, Wartsila, if you wish, the Finnish shipyard. They established a, a division called the Dream Shop, and the Dream Shop was responsible for designs like the one on the left, which is one of the monster, maritime monsters that look like, uh, oh, well, like an apartment building lying down on the surface of the ocean. But they also developed the concept of the small luxury yacht for very few passengers, a hundred or about a hundred. On the right, you have their first two, Sea Goddess One and Sea Goddess Two. They also, at the time, designed, they started designing sailing cruise ships. On paper, Kai Lavander was the naval architect who led the dream shop at Barcelona. He researched sail propulsion. He built an economic model of the cruise ship industry. And then he designed and tested a sailing cruise ship, one that would make money. Here was the artist's conception. When the man who eventually built Windstar first saw it, he said it looked like an upside down bathtub. And he wasn't gonna build it. The shipyard tested the design in their own wind tunnel. They were satisfied, but no, Ship owner, no cruise line owner could be tempted to build it until the entrepreneur entered. Carl Andren, a classical disruptor. Carl was 36 when he had the idea of entering the cruise business somehow by finding a new niche. And he owned New York's Circle Line, which advertises itself to this day as America's favorite boat ride. Now he was looking to make another kind of boat ride available to Americans and others and looking for a way to get into the cruise business. He was a, an immigrant, naturalized U.S. citizen. He was born and raised in Mariham in the Orland Islands, a small town that had a world reach. You can see on the map where Orland is is located between Finland and Sweden, uh, and they've bounced between the two, so much so that nowadays Åland Islanders speak Swedish, carry Finnish pass passports, and consider themselves Ålanders. They were, of course, Vikings, and I'm fond of introducing Carl as someone who descended from Vikings and was very proud of his Viking heritage. If I were in a room with you all, I'd ask you to pick out the Viking in this picture. And all of you probably would. He's the big guy in the middle with the big smile and the tan suit. Why is it that the Oland Islands were a significant part of Carl's background and how did they convince him to become the first to build a sailing cruise ship? I think it's because of the Oland Islands. The Oland Islands were the last home port of pure sailing freighters. In the picture, you see Pomern on the right and Passat on the left. The, uh, there was a ship owner in the Oland Islands who bought up sail ships as they were being replaced by steamers. And he ran them profitably with very skeleton crews on the longest round the world trade routes that were still open to sailing freighters. The last route they sailed between the two world wars 
became known in the British press as the Great Grain Races. You can see the route, the route, and you'd be familiar with it. Anyone who has followed the Whitbread Race, Round the World Race, the Volvo, or the original, the Golden Globe, knows out you go, but they, of course, go out the channel. The uh, wind wagons, the real ones, the four-masted steel barks, 212, 250 feet long, they didn't go through the channel uh, too tight for them. They preferred to go around the north of Scotland, then around Cape of Good Hope, and out to Australia, where they loaded 5,000 grain sacks, tons of grain, and sailed back, skirting Antarctica, and staying where? In the Southern Ocean. And this is where they made their living. Now, Varzila knew about this background. The engineers were familiar with it, but so did Carl, because his father made two round-the-horn sailing trips as a crewman on the flagship of those all-on sailors, the Herzogin Cecily, the Duchess, she was called. Uh, so Carl's, he, Carl grew up with a Cape Horner. And he, the boy from Holland, first looked at two ideas to get into the sailing cruise ship business. He looked at the better barefoot idea, you know, find a cruise, find a sailing ship that uh, maybe you could make into something a little bigger, a little better. And uh, then he started theorizing about somebody's yacht on steroids. And while he was mulling over those choices, which were not terribly appealing to him, the ship owner looking for a niche and the shipyard that had designed a ship for that niche, they found each other when Carl was on vacation in Finland, remember, Finnish was his native language, and they began to deal. His first deal was that he bought the the Varsela bid book. Now, a bid book in the shipbuilding business is a sheaf, and really is a book, of plans with some design specifications. Uh, Circle Line, Carl Andren in charge, called for bids on that book in April of 1984. And the bids came back pretty quickly, which was very encouraging for the, for the people who were working on the project. Carl, two others, an accountant and a retired uh, Coast Guard officer, as well as a French cruise line president. So the South Koreans came back low, the Swedes came back high, the Germans, a German shipyard bid 23 million, and Varzela bid 21 and a half. So the Varzela design was taken seriously around the world by other shipbuilders. A French yard came in very late, they were serious because they did it in August, and they came in low. But who needed a sailing cruise ship? Why ever would you build a sailing cruise ship? The answer Carl gave, and he always, when he was making a really serious point, slapped his chest. To build a ship to make money, that's why. But why in France? The shipyard that bid, submitted the lowest bid was known as the Atelier et Chantier du Havre, uh, easily enough, ACH, also known as ACH. The map shows the location in Le Havre, a shipyard that was built in the uh, late 19th century and had uh, four slips, four shipbuilding uh, slips, reduced to two. Uh, they made a very low bid, as I said, and the, the building crew on Dran's people began negotiating with them in the summer of 1984. Their bid of 19 million was 2 million below Varzila, and it was accepted on September 4th. 
there were two reasons for the acceptance, money, and I'll explain that, and passion. The French were tremendously passionate about the idea of building the sail ship, even though this yard had never built a passenger ship, had never built a sailing ship, but the last of the great long line French steel barks, the five-masted France, had been launched from the same yard in 1906. The money reason, that's quick. Carl explained it. He said that with Wartzilla and the financing package that was available in Finland, he and his money partner would have been on the hook for $10 million if the thing didn't work at all. If it never sailed, if it never was able to put to sea, if nobody wanted to sail on it and they were going to lose everything, they would also lose $10 million each. However, with the French and the financing that was available in the European Union under European Union rules, they would only lo lose $5 million if everything failed. But there was one lasting consequence to this decision. If they had gone with Varsila, they would have had the expertise of multiple passenger ships built. They would have had the production line of uh, modular building, building ships in sections and then joining the sections. But they would not have been able to influence the design once the contract was signed. So with this, with this decision, they committed themselves. The shipyard, the ship owner, and all of his representatives committed themselves to design while building. And that's where the story begins. The contract to build was 18 and a half million with interiors to come. It was signed in Paris on October 26th. The launch date fixed then was November 13th. 18th, 1985, because it had a very high lunar tide on that date, that morning. The delivery date for the ship built, fitted out, and successfully tested was September of 1986. And not only did he sign for the prototype, but Carl signed for two sister ships, Windstar, Windsong, and Wind Spirit. There were a lot of things wrong with the contract, I was told later, and I talked to the Circle Line attorney who reviewed, reviewed the contract. I asked him, what do you mean there was a lot wrong with it? He said, well, to begin with, it wasn't signed. Nonetheless, the yard began shaping hull steel on the 25th of January of 1985, and this was the ship they were going to build. Windstar, 360 feet at the waterline, 440 overall, including the bowsprit. Beam of 52 feet, draft 14. Rig, staysail schooner, four masts, each of them 204 feet off the water. Sail area of 21,500 square feet. By comparison, Palmer and set 36,800 all working sail. Her displacement, 5,307 tons. And main propulsion, and yes, she is and was conceived as a motor sailor was diesel electric, single screw propulsion. Oh, and yes, passengers. There were to be accommodations for 130 passengers. They, the shipyard process uh, was very well understood in Le Havre. They'd been building ships there for centuries. And it looked it. If you see in the upper right-hand corner a crane, that was the largest crane there, the shipyard possessed, and it came to France and then to the shipyard as reparations from Germany after World War I. The slipway on which Windstar and her sisters were built was built in uh, the 19th century. They went quite quickly until June of 1985, when the stern section was to be lifted on and welded into place, and the yard people, the people working on the ship, began to notice a slowdown in the rhythm of decisions. They saw it first when the 
shipwright, the lead shipwright, wanted to have the final dimensions for the opening in the transom, which was going to let down to let passengers play in the warm waters of the Caribbean, the sports platform. Uh, he was told that the dimensions had not yet been finalized. And that was the beginning of one of the difficulties of designing in place, designing as you build. The difficulty as it developed was not just, uh, it was not just a design or a build out difficulty. It also became a clash of cultures because the ship owner decided on an, a single designer for the interior of the ship. He was a Frenchman of Hungarian ancestry named Mark Held and Held in the upper uh, circle of this picture was as near a self-made man as can be conceived of in France. And he was the ship owner's choice. Now the shipyard and the two leading engineers are in the other two bubbles, including Francois Faurie at the bottom. You can see a stern and mm, very, uh, ri not rigid, but certainly a very correct man. And they thought they could do a fine job with the passenger cabins and other interior design without held. They figured that the interior designer's role was to choose the curtains and the color of the carpets. That was not Held's idea. Held wanted to create something new, something artistic, something different, but he missed deadlines. And the shipyard began squeezing him. Held, was a guy whose maximum academic qualification was as a junior high school gym teacher. Yet, he had designed and supervised the building of IBM's European headquarters in France. He was a very reputable designer and a very explosive personality. On the other side, at the shipyard, you had men who represented the very pinnacle of French professional education. Think of Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, and how you've seen him on, in recent television appearances. Slim, wearing a tie, very correct, short haircut, and look at the two engineers. The same kind of people. Held said they were like 19th century factory owners, and they ground and ground. And they said, Held can't make a deadline, and he can't read a plan. Why was it so difficult to build the interiors? Well, think of this. If you have a difficulty, if you have a debate over the shape of the bow of a ship like Windstar, and here she is in October of 1985, you can resolve it by calculating. Or you can draw three designs and settle on one. Uh, the engineers reign supreme. They, they decide. And if you look along the turn of her bilge, you'll see under the props a bilge keel. Well, you calculate the bilge keel for, for uh, stability, and the calculations tell you whether it has to be 36 inches or 42 wide. But when it comes to interior design, everybody's got an opinion. And that turned out to be the difficulty. But just before the launch, another difficulty raised its head. The communist uh, managed union at the shipyard voted 10 days before the launch to strike. The boss, an old guy named Gilbert Fournier, who had calculated the stresses on the masts as they were developing their bid, calculated the stresses on Windstar's masts under all conditions using a small Olivetti computer and programming it in machine language, and he did it in one weekend. This was the man whose entire project was at the mercy of his shipyard union. But in the words of a rival, old man Fournier is a fox. And what he did 
was play the political card. He called the communist mayor of Le Havre and he said, a lot of people are going to be out of work if we can't launch on time. Why don't you call your boss? And the communist mayor of Le Havre called the minister of in industry who was working for the socialist president of France, Francois Mitterrand, and made the point. By the afternoon of the day of his first call, just 13 hours before Windstar would have had to cancel her launch, he got the word that he, Fournier, would be able to launch, they could go ahead and launch the Windstar if he would promise to negotiate with the union. And he said, why, of course, of course I'll promise to negotiate with the union. And she was launched November 13th, 1985. It was a Friday, Friday, the 13th of November. And yet she slid down the ways without a hitch, genuflected to the land, and she was afloat. Work went on at her fitting out berth. It went on in the interiors, but not on the passenger decks because the interior design had not been settled. Held had won a couple of battles with the shipyard, he, uh, he got them to agree to design in very large windows, which were not usual on, uh, on lower decks, weather decks in passenger ships of the time, and said that they could get approval from the underwriters for the ship, the insurers of the ship, and they did. He also convinced them to use very thin wood veneer over galvanized steel in the modular construction of cabins and other passenger spaces down below. But he kept missing deadlines and they kept squeezing him. So he declared war. No, he said the war was over. He quit in December. It was brought back. He was brought back and the solution that they found to the standoff, which was held could not come to the yard and the yard could not come to Hell's offices. <clears throat> they built a womanly bridge. The ship owner's wife, Louise Andrin, a Swedish woman of great wisdom and the godmother of Windstar uh, took a flight every month to Paris for the remaining seven months of the construction of the ship and worked with Held's assistant, his girlfriend, uh, in Paris. And then she took the train to Havre and passed on all of the changes and all of the designs which the shipyard gladly set to work with and all sides were happy with the solution, but the shipyard then was left, the shipyard was then was left to pull together the interiors, Hell's Way, and they began. And the yard itself had to make the rig work. It had not been done for 60 years. The rig, the masts, the sails, the rigging, the controls were the heart of the enterprise. The shipyard was responsible for making them. They redesigned. They redesigned the masts so that the, each of the masts were 169 feet, six inches long, 30 inches at the base, tapering to 25 at the mast head. Now, carbon fiber was not reliable for that big uh, structure then. So they had to choose aluminum and thereby got themselves into complications because as most people who have worked with aluminum or have talked to welders who work with aluminum will know, when heat is applied to aluminum, it kind of squirms. So the technique they developed is pictured here. Every single welder on a 30 foot section of the mast of equal diameter, every single welder had to strike a, an arc at the same time. And when anyone had to sneeze or stop or ran out of space, they all had to stop at the same time. And they welded up the sections of 30 feet uh, each of a diminishing diameter, and then they joined them 
with steel rings. Yes, electrolysis. I know. So did they. And when it came to step the mast, the day, it was the day the engineers held their breath, July 5th. They designed all the masts as standing columns, of course, and then they built them lying down, which turned them into sort of tubular bridges. They could calculate how to support and move that bridge, and they knew what would happen once they got the mast in place, but they couldn't calculate what might happen when the mast swung from bridge to column which it did on the 5th in the rain, up and over and into place, while the two engineers, the engineer and the shipwright, who were responsible for the masts, looked off at the horizon and away from the lifting exercise. Then they turned around and the masts were in place and they said, now we can sleep or breathe again. On the following Monday, she had two masts. And if you look, you'll see a bridge in the background. That bridge is over the River Seine. And that bridge was used by commuters every day who came to La Havre to work. And I took this picture early enough in the morning so that the commute was underway. And the commuting car stopped. And there was no honking, no French shouting, just simply a well-mannered halt in traffic as people took in the new ship in town, Windstar. And that was the beginning of the city's love affair with the ship. Well, the sails came quickly. They were to be on roller furling stays. Uh, the staysail dimensions are here. 158 feet at the luff and 55, well, 56 on the foot, 137 at the leech. They were 3,767 3, square feet each and they weighed 1,500 pounds each. They arrived on time, but there was no wind to test them. And then it began to show that the shipyard was late. They were late with the hydraulics and this was a shipyard that was specialized in hydraulics. They were late building out the passenger spaces, the disco, and the bar, the pool bar. And on the eve of the very first scheduled sea trial, the Union showed up again and occupied the ship. This time, Fournier didn't even mess around. He went himself right onto the ship, told them they'd all lose their jobs, and his, he would close both the yard in Le Havre, and he would see to it that their yard in uh, the in Bordeaux was also going to be closed. Then he called the police. By the afternoon, the union had faded away. The police had established a perimeter and fitting out went on. Now, remember she was supposed to be delivered, fully tested by September and yet she was not finished. The passenger spaces weren't finished, but the, the cruise line had a very lucrative full ship charter to sail from Miami in early November. In order to make that charter, they had to sail on October 12th. So as you see in the picture, they put aboard the essentials, the beer on the left, and the shipyard's lead engineer on the right, and all of his working companions. And they began on her maiden voyage, a prototype Two out of the four sails worked, and only under manual control. There was supposed to be a computer to control the sails. It was on board, but it spent most of its time crashing. Just over half of the 60 cabins had been finished. The engine and the galley spaces had all been put in place and tested and inspected, but the whole crew was untrained except for the officers who had been accompanying the last stages of construction. Carl Andren was ill and did not sail with his ship, but his father, Vicar, the Cape Horner, did. Fortunately for the ship, as Vicar's first calling, he once told me, had been to be a Lutheran minister. And he needed all of his priestly skills because the sailing officers were absolutely fed up with the shipyard when they put to sea. We got to underway at 5 p.m. on October 13th. 
it was not a Friday, sailed through the locks into the main arbor of Le Havre. And as we went through the locks, we, they were lined in silence by people standing silently on both sides of the lock leading to the main harbor. And as we went through, a small boy shouted up, Bon voyage, capitaine! And the Norwegian captain, the first captain of Windstar, took off his hat, waved it, put his hat back on his head, and we went out to the harbor master's office, and there was a crowd there. And we got to the mole at the entrance, and there was a crowd there, which the French paper said was 10,000 strong. I calculate, based on my newspaper experience, it was more like 4,000, but that's a lot of people to see a ship off, a prototype with half her spaces unfinished. First thing that officers did the next day was clean the ship. And two days later, the rig that had been tested in a model in a pond sailed for the first time, October 15th. She sailed, four staysails only, 6.6 .6 knots with the propeller feathered. She tacked and she jived, all under manual control. And while this was going on, a container ship inbound for a northern European port altered course in order to see what kind of ship was this. And she passed close under our stern. And if the sailors in the audience will look closely at the ship's side, look at Windstar's starboard side, you'll see the telltale signs of leeway. Yes, she was drifting to leeward even as she made headway. So much so that that night, one of the Norwegian officers said, did you see how much she sailed sideways? He said, you know, if she keeps this up, we could be in the Canaries in a week sideways. We didn't go to the Canaries. We went to the Azores. And on the way to the Azores, with the wind pouring off the hill, I clocked her at, in the, just before this picture, at 13 and a half knots sail and power and not full sail. But then in the trade winds on October 20th, 30 knots of wind, the profile, the uh, fairing uh, on the roller for the form of staysail failed. Uh, rivets sheared and showered on deck and the ship was wounded in her transit across the Atlantic. The damage was repaired aloft in the Bahamas over two days by two men, 78-year-old uh, inventor of the roller furling rig and a 28-year-old yard sailor who had ocean racing experience. And then on our way into Miami, another roller stay peeled apart. And Miami, she was supposed to have nothing but sail on her way into Miami. They debated as they closed the, the South Florida coast, the Gold Coast, lined with cliffs of apartment buildings. They debated whether to put the wounded sail, whether to set it, whether to get it in place. And the shipyard couldn't decide. They were still responsible. And finally, yes, they did. And so Windstar came toward government cut in Miami on that November day uh, on a broad reach in 20, 18 to 20 knots of wind gusting over 22 and an outgoing tide. And she was met by tugs and yachts. The yacht clubs turned out, but not 4,000 people. And very few stopped fishing or strolling. But the Norwegians knew how to sail and look. They went wing and wing. They sailed her the way a traditional schooner dead downwind should be sailed. One sail to port, one sail to starboard. One sail to port, one sail to starboard. They sailed her into government cut on wing and wing. And as she came in, the shipyard engineer came rushing into the pilot house and reached for the engine controls to, but the pilot grabbed his arm and said, what are you trying to do? And for he said, why, we must sail in, we must sail. She can sail now, we must sail. We will cut the engines. And the pilot answered, I think not. 
He said, I've got a, an 18 knot wind astern and a four knot outgoing tide and I don't want to scratch the paint. So the engineer went outside. It was a terribly exciting moment, so exciting that everyone was outside the pilot house and on deck watching the display as they came into government cut in Miami on a Saturday with other cruise ships getting ready to depart. And the pilot went to the engine controls and cut them to nothing. And he got on his radio and he called the tug that's to the right in this picture, the Mary Belcher, and he said, Mary Belcher, Windstar over. Mary Belcher, go ahead. Mary Belcher, this is Windstar. We're doing eight knots under sail alone. And Mary Belcher said, it's a great day, Windstar. And she sailed down government cut. And the first ship to salute her was the Norway, the old France who had been built, which had been built in love. And she went to her berth and she became a Caribbean sailing cruise ship and went to many, many other places in the world. I think people in the audiences, had audience tonight, have sailed aboard Windsor. Uh, I knew she was going to be a good ship, a happy ship, because on the way across the Atlantic in the trade winds, we sailed through a squall just at sunrise and a rainbow formed in that squall. And the squall, the rainbow formed a circle and the ship sailed through the rainbow circle. And that is how the Windstar was built. What's the future of uh, commercial sail in, it's hard to know, but I got wind of another project in 2008 kite surfing container ship. Thank you. Thank you very much.